Okay, so you can share, see my screen now, right? Yes. Great. And let's see, we got some people in here yet. Yes, we have people joining us. So welcome everybody. We hope you're here to listen to creating a school safety plan. So lots of parents who are, are hiding out somewhere in their house right now, like you guys are. <laughs> I'm not seeing us on here yet, though. Hmm. Maybe that's just my computer, but let's just see what's going on. OK, we're good. Okay, great. Thank you. I see Claire is telling me that she can see us in the welcome screen. So that's great. Thank you, Claire. I appreciate it. Sometimes you just don't know how everybody's seeing on the other end. So love the feedback. Thank you. So we have more people joining. We're still a little bit early, so we'll give you guys a chance to come in. If you have anything that you would like to say during this, just write in the chat box. You don't, and you don't have to raise your hand. We're very casual. Just put your comments in the chat. And we'll be starting in a couple minutes. I see more people joining. Here they come. So curious, where we have 16 people. Where are you all from? Tell us in the chat box. Let me see if I can see who's here. Oh, I see my friend Marcella is here. Who is in Connecticut? Rachel is here. We know Rachel. Lots of new friends. So this is great. Worcester, Worcester, New York City, Melbourne, Melbourne Australia. Thank you for getting up early for us. Uh, Lodi, Wisconsin, Ecuador, London, Vancouver. And we, we just discovered Abby has logged in from um, Southwest Iowa. And I am in Florida and Maya is in Ohio. So we've got a lot of people from all over the place here. This is great. Uh, it's exactly 7.30 now. We'll just give, wait a few more minutes. I know a lot of people have marked this in their agenda. And yep, there's Rachel from Austin, Texas. Hi, Rachel. I see the names of a lot of places on this list that I was hoping to get to this year. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so we'll just give it another minute, minute or two. Obviously, this, you are all parents, and so sometimes things get uh, delayed when you're taking care of your kids before you need to get on a call, right? <laughs> so we'll give people another minute. And then we'll get started. So a minute after 7.30. So why don't we start? We don't want to penalize people who are here on time and then everybody else can join as they're as they're ready. So let's get started now. Um, my name is Eileen Michelli. And I'm the Chief Program Officer for the Martha Ann Foundation. I want to welcome all of you to our International E3 Summit, Educating, Empowering, and Enriching Our Community, brought to you by the Martha Ann Foundation and our divisions, the Louise Deep Syndrome Foundation and the BEDS Movement, 
and our partners in Europe at FASERN. We're grateful to our presenting sponsors, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and American Communications Construction, which is based in Houston. Uh, before we start the presentation, even though this is not a medical or scientific session, I do want to let you know that, um, that this, is, this, this summit is to provide, provide an open forum for discussion. And so the opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Markan Foundation or Bassern. And I particularly want to point out tonight that um, Maya and Abby, you know, both have um, extensive experience here in the US. We have a lot of international folks here on the phone and so, or on the call or on the webinar. And so your, your situations might be a little different, your regulations might be a little different, but um, you'll get some great insights into how um, people here deal with it. So for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go on to Maya's presentation. And after that, we will hear from Abby and we will get to your questions after that. So we're gonna shut our webcams off and then we will, and then we will get to Maya here. Hi, I'm Maya Brown Zimmerman, and this is this is creating a school safety plan for Marfan, Louis Dietz, and Beds, keeping your child safe while ensuring they have equal opportunities for academic success. I have Marfan syndrome, and I parent four kids who have different uh, disabilities, including Marfan syndrome, and I volunteer as an advocate to help parents navigate the special education process, both in putting together their 504 and IEP plans, and then in working with the schools to make sure that their child's needs are met. So I wanna start off by talking about important definitions. The first is FAPE, which stands for Free and Appropriate Public Education. This is what every child is entitled to. LRE is the least restrictive environment, and that's how school has to determine placement. TOR is the teacher of record, the teacher assigned to your child's IEP. IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And ETR is the evaluation team report. This is what determines if there's an educational need for services. It may also be called an MFE or multi-factored evaluation. And finally, there's prior written notice. And that's where the school explains what they are doing and what they're refusing to do and why and everything they considered and why those things are not happening. It also must remind parents of the procedural safeguards and sources that parents can go to for help understanding all of this. So let's talk about health plans versus 504s versus IEPs. Start off with health plans. This only includes medical information. So it'll have the day-to-day -day issues like uh, pain management on a daily basis or if your child takes medication at school, that sort of thing. Then it will cover the emergency plans, what to look for and what to do. So we include um, pneumothorax, what are the symptoms of a pneumothorax, and then who to call if Julian is exhibiting those symptoms. Um, retinal detachment, including that the school let me know if he hits his head at all so that I can continue to assess vision after he's home. And then obviously signs of aortic dissection and other cardiovascular issues. Depending on your child's diagnosis, you might include um, signs of an organ rupture or of an anaphylactic reaction. Then it also includes doctor and hospital information, which specialist to call um, and which hospital to send your child to if an issue arises. And I would put in a plug for Backpack, which is the app that uh, the foundation has created the research database with. You can put all of your child's medical information there and share it easily with a password protected PDF to anybody. This makes it really easy to send the information to the school and to uh, you know, EMTs or the emergency room if your child has to go there during school hours. So 504 versus an individualized education plan or an IEP. The 504 is named for section 504 of the American with Disabilities Act and the IEP comes from the IDEA. You cannot have both. An IEP will encompass a 504 and then some, and either one of those can encompass the health plan. There are no restrictions on services provided with either, so the school can't say, oh, you can't have that on a 504. But the IEP changes the curriculum and the 504 changes the environment. An IEP means having one of 13 specific disabilities listed. 
and other health impaired is one of the diagnoses that are used. And so that's how kids with connective tissue disorders can qualify for an IEP. Um, but in addition to having one of those disabilities, it also requires that the child's ability to learn or benefit from the general education curriculum must be impacted or their educational performance. A 504 can be any disability though, and it must interfere with their ability to learn in a regular education classroom. With an IEP, if you disagree, you can ask the school to pay for an independent evaluation, but with a 504, you have to provide this yourself. Now we're gonna talk accommodations versus modifications, because these are words that you're gonna hear at school a lot. Accommodations are how, and modifications are what. So accommodations are the changes in the way that materials are presented or in the way that students respond to the materials, as well as changes in setting, timing, and scheduling. An accommodation refers to how the general education curriculum will be presented to the student with disabilities so that he or she can understand the general education curriculum, such as using a scribe, braille, extended time, large print textbooks, etc. Modifications are changes that can be made to what students are expected to learn. For most students with disabilities, modifications should only be considered after all types of accommodations have been exhausted. Modifications may include partial completion of the program or course requirements, teaching less material, uh, where the following happen, like fewer objectives, shorter units, fewer problems, uh, curriculum below uh, age or grade level, et cetera. Assistive technology is generally considered something for an IEP. So now you wanna know how to start the process. If you take nothing else away from this workshop, what I want you to take away is that everything must be in writing all the time. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. So you want to, if there's any chance that your child might qualify for an IEP, you'll ask for a multi-factor evaluation in writing. If you just wanna go for the 504, uh, or health plan, then you can just put that request in writing. You want to prepare your documents. These include any evaluations you've had done, any letters from doctors or other specialists outlining what your child needs, um, any assignments that would point to your child's disability. Um, for example, stuff where they had to do handwriting and you see that their handwriting is not leg legible. Any emails you've had with teachers, if you have phone or in-person conversations with teachers, take notes afterwards. You want to have all the documentation for your case possible. Then you also want to know your timeline. So the timeline is different for each state. For example, whether they're going off calendar days or work days. In Ohio, where I am, the school has 30 days from the request to either get parental permission for an evaluation or to refuse an evaluation with prior written notice. They have 60 days to complete the actual testing once parental permission is obtained, and that includes the ETR meeting. Once the ETR decides that an IEP is warranted, then they have 30 days to hold that meeting, and the IEP must be implemented as soon as possible after the IEP meeting. There's an annual IEP review with triannual reevaluation. So what do you ask for? You need to keep in mind needs versus wants. And I would research for reasonable expectations um, based on you know, what it is that you're asking for. What have other people had covered in their IEPs or 504s? You need to understand that the school must meet the need, but they don't have to meet the need the way that you want them to. So here are some problems that you would commonly see with kids with connective tissue disorders and potential solutions. If your child's having pain when writing, the school might provide a scribe, a computer, extra time, occupational therapy, or an occupational therapy consult, which is where they're not getting direct therapy, but the OT works with the teacher to uh, provide tools or you know, changes to the classroom for the student. If they're having pain in class, then you might ask for movement breaks, use of padding, bigger desk. Mobility issues could mean extra time between classes, use of an elevator, of an aid, or physical therapy. If you have activity restrictions, then your child might get adaptive PE, alternative activities in PE, homeschool PE, 
or health class counting as PE. Do not accept the teacher making your child get dressed for PE and sit on the sidelines and watch their classmates. That is not individualized education. There's always something that they can create for your child to do and I would insist on that. If your child has vision difficulties, you could ask for front row seating, large print books, magnifying equipment, or a scribe. Other things to consider are um, asking to keep a water bottle handy due to medic medication effects, double textbooks, one set for the classroom, one set for home so your child's never having to carry those around, use of a backpack or a rolling backpack. My son's school uh, has a rule against rolling backpacks, but he's allowed to have one because of his 504. No penalization for absences. So our state automatically sends out truancy letters if you miss a certain number of hours of school. But because we have that addressed in the 504, then I'm just directed to ignore the letters when they come in. Uh, classroom location. So a classroom that's on the first floor or a classroom near the nurse's office if your child needs to go there frequently. Time for outside services. For example, the school would not provide uh, Julian with occupational therapy. And so we worked out that I took him uh, somewhere else for OT and he came to school late once every two weeks. Um, because of his morning appointment. A nurse, if your child is uh, uses a G-tube, they may need a nurse. Or assistive technology training for you, your student, and the teachers. But the school and I disagree on the content of the IEP or 504, or the school is not properly implementing these. So if you disagree on the content, then when you sign to implement the IEP, make sure you also write I consent to this IEP being implemented, but I object to it for the reasons stated during the meeting. And then write a thank you email to all the members of the team afterwards, outlining your disagreements again. Then you can request mediation. The state pays the cost for that and the results are legally binding. Or you can request a due process hearing, which is a trial. The state laws vary quite a bit on how that process works. Do not do either of these alone. We want to hire an advocate or a lawyer, and we will talk about advocates more in a few minutes. If there's an issue with the 504, because that falls under the ADA, then you can file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, and the links that are being shown during the presentation, I can get to you later if you would like. Uh, the complaint's really easy to file online, and then they will decide whether or not they're going to do an investigation. You can also tape record meetings out in the open. Do not secretly tape record because that's against the law in some states. If you bring a tape recorder, it is going to change the tenor of the meeting, but if you're having a lot of issues with the school district, then it may be worth it. Also, bring in specialists with you when you can, um, either to the meeting or have them call into the meeting. What are the consequences for schools? There's a website that explains different types of violations and consequences. Again, I can get this link to you after the presentation if you would like. So how to choose an advocate. So first you have to decide what are you looking for? Are you looking for silent support, just a body in the room who's gonna help hold the school accountable? Are you looking for somebody who's gonna to go to fight for you or somebody in between? We made the mistake of looking for an in-between and hiring somebody who uh, is a known fighter. She came into the meeting, burned the whole thing to the ground. We ended up firing each other in the parking lot after the meeting. Um, so my fault for not being more clear about what it is that I was looking for. Um, you can go to ARC. If you search ARC Advocates, then you'll find their website. Um, Facebook is how I found the advocate that uh, was a real fighter. Um, the County Board of Developmental Disabilities or Regional Center may have some, local agencies, and then your school should have a parent advocate as well. The only thing is that the parent advocate for the school works for the school. So they will help you understand the law and they'll attend a meeting with you, but they're not gonna advocate on your child's behalf. Depending on where you get the advocate, they may be free or they may charge. Also, I want to talk about emergency planning. In the case of a fire, an active shooter, etc., how will your child be removed from the building? 
This is especially important to discuss if your child's in a wheelchair or has significant mobility issues. Some schools are putting the kids in the stairwells to wait for the first responders. And if you're not comfortable with this, you need to make sure that's not the plan for your child. And the way to address that is through their health plan 504 or IEP. There's also what's called twice exceptional. And these are kids who uh, qualify as gifted and talented and then also have a disability. So the gifted and talented evaluations happen in second grade and again in third through fifth. And the school must use multiple tools to make the gifted and talented designation. Sometimes schools will try to tell you that a child's IQ is too high for special education, but this is not the case. A child must be measured against their expected performance and not against arbitrary general standards. A student does not have to fail to qualify for special education services. Now, homebound instruction is something that's on a lot of people's minds right now um, with the virtual schooling option. If your child's school does not offer a virtual school option right now, but because of what's going on, you feel like they need to be at home, um, then this is something to discuss. Homebound instruction is not an issue that's covered explicitly by IDEA, and it's considered a highly restrictive environment. So the school has to provide LRE. This is where it's a, it's a last choice. So you need to have the doctor outline reasons for homebound instruction in detail. What's the diagnosis? What exactly is needed? For how long does the student need to be homebound? Um, all of that. And it can work in a variety of ways. You could have a child who goes to school when they can and get services when they can't. A blend, so the student goes to school one or two days a week and then they get a few hours at home. Or intermittent, a month at home, a month at school, um, just depending on their situation. State requirements for when homebound can start and how many hours are required vary significantly. So before you start this process, contact your state's Department of Education to find out what the rules are and what information you're going to need to present to the school. In terms of services, the school has to provide whatever is in the IEP. So if the IEP calls for physical therapy and your child goes homebound, the physical therapist needs to come to the house. If the child is working with a special education teacher, then the special education teacher needs to be the one who's working with them in the home. If your child is in private school, what do they have to provide? So public school has to test any child, even children in private school. So if your child, for example, goes to a parochial school and you think they have a disability, you can go to the public school to have them tested. But the public school's responsibility beyond that varies depending on state. Private schools are not part of IDEA and they do not need to provide IEPs. If the private school receives federal funding, then they have to follow a 504 and if they don't, then they don't. So this means that they can't discriminate against your child for having a disability, but they don't have to significantly change their program to accommodate the child. What is considered a minor versus a major accommodation is not well defined. Extra test times, wheelchair ramps, and tape recorders are all kind of well-known examples of being reasonable. Significant changes to the workload or changes to enrollment criteria are likely not going to be considered reasonable. Private schools can recuperate money from family for services that cause a substantial increase in cost, but that's not well-defined. If a public school places a child in private school, because the public school has determined that they cannot meet the child's needs, then the school is responsible for providing FAPE. If you put your child in a private school because you don't feel like the school is meeting their needs, then the school is not required to provide FAPE. There are also slightly different educational rules for private schools that offer special education, like autism specific schools. So this is rightslaw.com. This website is going to be your best friend. Also, look at their corresponding Facebook pages, and if you have the opportunity to attend a rights law workshop in your area, then it is well worth the time and money. Um, Mr. Pete Wright is a lawyer who specializes in education law, and he goes around the US and teaches workshops that are a day long on how to navigate issues with the school and on your state's particular laws. Um, I've attended one and they are fabulous and I use his website and Facebook page for lots of things. Any questions? 
Thank you so thank you so much, um, Maya. I've got too many things open here, so let me get rid of that. We're gonna have Abby come on, and she, let me stop sharing so we can see her. There she is, and she's going to talk about her experience. Okay, so um, my son John. Um, has, is diagnosed with bed. So I'm going to go a little bit more into that um, and what we've had experience with in our school. Um, so anyway, um, John was diagnosed with beds almost seven years ago at the age of two. And I always tell parents that the most important part of sending your child off to school um, and keeping them safe is to have a close relationship with your child's school and the teachers. Um, open the door of communication and have those conversations beforehand. So before you're sending your kid off to school, um, you know, really communicate, uh, communicate that with the teachers. Um, when John was diagnosed, one of my biggest fears was something happening to him when I wasn't around. So I decided I really needed to create those relationships and educate those who would be around him in order to advocate for him in my place. One of the first things I did when he was starting preschool was to take a letter I had from his geneticist explaining beds to our school nurse. In that letter, it explained that any severe onset of pain was a medical emergency. Um, the nurse put together an emergency health plan so it would be available if needed. Um, once John, John was entering kindergarten at a larger school, we asked the school nurse to coordinate a meeting for us. I put together a paper with a picture of John on it, um, and it just briefly explained VEDS, um, what to watch for and how to handle the emergency situation. Um, so Eileen, if you wanna share, that's the paper I had, I have a picture of what we use. Um, so this might just give you an idea, um, you know, you can kind of tweak it. I, I actually got it from a friend of mine whose um, kids also had VEDS, um, so you can read on John's um, at the top. So it says notify 911 dispatch EMS first responders. Um, and it says John Jonathan is the project's Austin child. So that is a program we have in our area um, through the Children's Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. We live in a rural area about an hour away. So in the event in a, of an emergency, Children's has in place this project Austin that they can do emergency expedites. Um, so that might be something in your area that you could check in to see if your hospital, if your children's hospital has a program like this. Um, and that's been very helpful. That's been very helpful for us. Um, you can see it also has my husband and I cell phone numbers. Um, I print several copies of this every year. Um, we make it a priority to, to approach everyone individually. Um, don't assume that the administration will take care of passing these out or um, notifying the teachers of your child's um, issue um, because of the HIPAA and privacy laws. Obviously, that I learned that um, you really have to go individually to the teachers. You know, hand these out um, and introduce your you know introduce your kids to them and let them make that connection. Um, we ended up having a meeting where the school principal, PE teacher, um, nurse, and all kindergarten teachers attended. It was a great meeting. They asked lots of questions about VEDS um, and really wanted to know more and how they could best protect him while still, in, still allowing him um, not to feel different, you know, from the other kids. Um, I felt much more comfortable sending him off to school, knowing these teachers I had met would be looking after him. Um, so we are now entering third grade um, every year. Um, you know, like I've like I said, we go around to all of the teachers. This year was a little different because of COVID. Um, I ended up just emailing these um, to the principal. Um, John actually took it up on himself. Um, took a bunch of flyers to um, his teachers, and he really I think that helped him feel more a part of it. Um, and I got emails back from his teachers that they got the flyers, um, that they were ready for him. Um, so that worked, that, it ended up working out pretty well this year considering everything going on with COVID. Um, and then word always, I, I feel like word always spreads around the school. Um, you know, once you've met a lot of teachers every year they move up, a lot of the, you know, the next year teachers already know 
um, who your child is. So it works out, you know, you really need to make those connections again. That's, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, so you need to remember, even if they aren't your child's teacher, they can still help keep an eye on your children in the halls, recess, lunchroom, um, you know, just open that door for communication. Um, th you know, things I hadn't thought about um, that we started doing was um, his bus driver. Um, so every year the bus driver gets one of the, you know, we introduce John to his bus driver and he gets a paper also. Um, go to the school office, the music room, art class, um, obviously PE. Um, hound out the papers and introduce yourself in, the, in your child. Um, this is what has really worked um, the best for us. Um, it really gives me confidence that there are a lot of eyes on John when he's at school and that in an emergency, um, they're prepared and educated enough on VEDS and they will be able to help him. And that's all I have right now. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Abby. Maya, why don't you put your camera back on and, um, and, your, and your audio, there you go. And thank you both so much for sharing all that information. I did put a lot of those, all those links in the chat box and Abby if it's okay with you we can share that I'll see if I can share that flyer in the chat box as well um, after this session so um, lots of questions for everybody and so why don't we start with the first one that was the most popular in the Q&A how do you deal with P physical education classes Maya why don't you start with that okay um so I made the mistake of not requiring uh the phys ed teacher to be at the 504 meetings which has been rectified. So now we don't have a 504 meeting without the gym teacher being there. Um, the reasoning being that although the gym teachers were, you know, they got the 504, they read it, the importance of following the 504 didn't always hit home until I talked with them in person. Um, but we also send them a copy of the physical activity guidelines that are on the foundation's website, that PDF under patient resources. Um, and for Julian, we say um, no contact sports, no dodgeball, um, no long jump, no timed tests, like no timed running, um, and no isometric activities like sit-ups, push-ups, weightlifting. Um, and that, and we have to stress that it includes the presidential fitness exam because we've had multiple years where the gym teacher thought that like they could do all the activities that they're not supposed to if it were for the presidential fitness exam, but just not any other time for the 504. Um, so now everybody's on the same page about that. Um, but so far, um, with the exception of last year, Julian is still enrolled in gym. Um, he's going into fourth grade this year. And I think when he goes to middle school, we're gonna pull him out of gym and do one of the alternative uh, gym options that I mentioned in the presentation. Abby, how about you? How have you handled uh, physical education classes? Um, so our um, PE teacher, he is, he went to our first, you know, big meeting when we pulled everyone in. And um, in our school, John has, we'll have him from, it would be K through um, fourth grade. So he has him again next year. Um, he has, um, at this point, my cell phone number even in his cell phone. Um, if there's ever a question as to whether John can do something or not, he, I mean, he will reach out to me. Um, his, his is pretty much the same as Maya's, um, you know, no, we do mostly, you know, nothing that's really going to increase his blood pressure quick. Um, you know, isometric exercise, dodgeball, um, any high contact, you know, nothing like that or sprinting. Um, and, you know, our PE teacher, I mean, there are things that they can do to accommodate the kids. Um, if they are playing games, he'll give John a softer ball um, that he can use, that he can still play. Um, if it is something that John just really can't do, um, he's able to take a friend um, and then they'll go shoot hoops or something. Um, and I will, also, um, I will also say that our school um, under John's plan, he has an IEP for educational reasons. And so then we have his um, health plan in within his IEP. Um, and in that, um, our school gives John a para, which is a one-on-one -on -one person um, that goes to PE with him. So it gives him, 
just an, an extra set of eyes on him. You know, they're usually helping the PE teacher, but if John, you know, isn't able to participate, then the pair will take John and let him take a friend and they'll go do something else. Great. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, oh, and if I can add, I would make it, um, I would emphasize with the teacher that it's their responsibility to um, know what the, the rules are and not have your child be the one responsible for telling them that they can't participate. Because I don't know about your kids, but mine has a really hard time going up to a, an adult and telling them no. And so it needs to be on the gym teacher, not on your child. Great, thank you for that. How do you get the school and other care providers to treat your child as usual, but to call an ambulance before they call you and you know, if they're non-responsive or collapse or something? I mean, you're giving all these questions, but you still want your child to be treated normal. So is that an issue or how do you handle that? I mean, the health plan, you outline really clearly the who you call and in what order, and you just are really detailed with that. Um, if the school's not following your health plan, then you need to get a lawyer involved, in my opinion. Um, and to get them, you know, to treat normally, it's a, a balance. You know, we, we say to let Julian do what he's going to do at recess mm -hmm. and um, talk about all the things that he can do and ask them to not make a big deal out of what he can't in front of the other kids. And, and I'll add to that, um, the for, first portion of it, um, if any child, to me, if any child was unresponsive, the, the first thing to do would be to call 911 before, you know, before any parent is called. I mean, if it's an emergency whatsoever, you know, even if there's an onset of severe pain for, you know, I, I mean, I would, I would, I would hope that they would call 911 before they would call the parent. So yeah, I, I would, I agree with what Maya says too, though. I mean, you really, you want your kids to be able to play at recess and, but you know, there, there's a line there where, you know, if there, if there's a real emergency, I mean, 911 needs to be called immediately. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the UK. Um, this parent says that her son has low ease deeds and doesn't feel supported. He has great anxieties going back in September lack of information and, and understanding from the from the school and the teachers, I guess, doesn't help. And even though the parent provides all the information to all concerned, they still feel unsupported. So any help and advice? It would be nice to know more if you wanted to like add in the comments um, what they feel unsupported about. Um, my child definitely has a lot of health-related anxiety, especially after things that happened at the beginning of last year with gym class. Um, so he has a counselor that he talks with. Um, we have a, a psychologist, but sometimes he'll also talk with the school counselor, um, and that's really helpful. Um, but otherwise, addressing specific issues with the school, or if you have the option of an advocate in the UK, um, but if you wanna give us more info too. Okay, I'm watching for that, so I will let you know. Um, any thoughts, maybe Abby, you wanna start with this. Any thoughts on holding a child back for another year of kindergarten, giving them time to catch up to their peers? Um, I guess I would, I would want, I would um, need to know more about the reason. Um, if, you know, I have, I mean, not just my child with beds. I mean, I have a, I have, a child, a middle child that is, a, I mean, he's a boy and he's a summer child. So we held him back um, and didn't start him as soon. But um, I don't know if it, if it is reasons related to, I mean, a, con the, a connective tissue disorder or, um, you know, is it is it just holding him back to start him a year later because of the connective tissue disorder? I guess, I don't know if there would be a, like an underlying reason for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Maya, do you have any thoughts? I would talk um, with your specialist and then also with the school psychologist and guidance counselor because there are um, consequences either way, especially depending on where the child's age falls. I mean, there are a lot of summer kids that start a year later um, just anyway, um, but if your child would be a lot older, I would definitely want to weigh the um, risks and benefits psychologically and physically. Because these conditions don't affect 
intelligence. Uh, these conditions alone right. don't infect, affect intelligence. So that's, that's a good point. Well, the, if, if that was the if if that was maybe part of the question, then I mean I'll speak on VEDS. It it doesn't affect you know cognitively any anything like that. And the joint issues are not going to magically get better with a year age. I mean, I guess I could see where like some things might be easier if they're older, but I mean, Julian's going into fourth. He's an older birthday anyway. Um, and he's still lagging behind his peers um, in terms of gross and fine motor skills um, and would even if we held him another year. Um, thank you for that. Um, are there any considerations for preschoolers in a daycare setting? Do so either of you have any information on that or experience? So, um, once the child turns three, then they are in the U.S. They are eligible for school district services. Um, they don't have 504s until kindergarten. So, it's, if the child qualifies for an IEP between ages three and five, then the school district depending on how their program functions, may have your child come, like invite them to their preschool because all districts offer preschool services for kids who qualify, or they may provide services at the daycare setting. Um, and so that's something to potentially look into. Daycares, if they are privately run, don't have to take every child. And I do know families um, whose kids have had more complex medical issues who have been turned away from daycares because of that. So you definitely want to interview the daycare and see um, how comfortable they are with your kids' needs. And then I would look at the school district. And if they're younger than three at daycare, then the county, through the early intervention program, um, is the one who covers any therapeutic services. In Ohio, that's called Help Me Grow. In Indiana, it's First Steps. Um, every state has a different name for it, but if you just search birth to three services, you'll be able to find it. And that's a different document called an Individualized Family Service Plan or an IFSP. Abby, do you have anything to add to that? Was like that in Iowa or she's got all the acronyms it, down? Um, it, it, just everything Maya said, we utilized all of that. Um, for John, he received um, services from zero to three through for in-home. Um, he needed some speech, um, some help with speech, and he got a little bit of um, therapy. And um, he transitioned then into a public preschool at three, and then they did the services there um, at the preschool. Um, yeah, and then he went on to kindergarten. So. Um, yeah, just what Maya said. We just utilized exactly what she said. Oh, and I would look, I would reach out to your county um, birth to three program as well, because at least in the part of Ohio where I live, they have a partnership with daycares where the county comes in and offers disability training. And then the daycares agree to take any child with any disability and they get some extra funding from the state for that. And so when we were looking at a daycare for one of my other kids who has different disabilities, we were able to pull up from that list. And sometimes there's also um, funding available for the parents to help them be able to send their kid to that, to that preschool. So um, look at that as a potential option too. Great, thanks so much. Um, so now we're in this era where a lot of kids are being, um, they're, they're in remote learning situations. So what kind of, modifications or accommodations would they need or could they ask for when they're doing re remote learning? I know you touched upon it a bit, Maya, in your presentation. So we're doing remote learning for Julian this year, and we just had his 504 meeting this week. I've had three 504 or an IEP meetings this week. Um, and what we were told is that they have to provide, they have to word everything on his 504 as though it would be for both home and virtual. So we didn't take away any of the things for in school, um, but the accommodations that he had all work really well for virtual. It gets very easy to take breaks for pain or from gym class or modify the gym activities when I'm the one who's um, helping him with those. Um, and everything's on the computer. If you're doing virtual learning that is not on a computer, then that might be something um, to ask about. But I can't think of anything in particular that we wouldn't already have had covered for the school. Okay. 
But how about you, Abby? Are your kids, is your son in school now or virtual learning? Um, he, he is in school. Um, he just start he just started um, this week. Um, and they're just teaching them. I mean, right now they're teaching them, you know, in case we do have to go to home learning. Um, and I have, in that case, I can't think of anything um, VEDS related that, you know, that we would need to change in his um, IEP or his health plan or anything. Um, it would probably be easier, honestly. Right, thank you. I just want to remind everybody that the, the, we're in the app where it says session Q&A is where you can put your questions. And so feel free to, um, to continue asking questions. We, I do have a couple more here, but we have some time. So uh, any other questions for Maya and Abby, um, that would be great. So this, is, this question is a little scary, you guys. So um, don't shoot the messenger. Um, what about, are you thinking about college yet? Like, do you have any considerations yet for college or um, what, what your requirements are gonna be? Maybe where you're gonna send them, what you're gonna think about? I know you can't hardly imagine, right? Um, I used to work in college admissions. So I can tell you a little bit about that process too. I actually took a slide out of this presentation on college stuff. So first of all, what you do in K through 12 does not translate to college. They don't know that your kid had an IEP or a 504. It's not gonna affect um, admission. The admission office doesn't know about your kid's accommodations. So don't not give your kid accommodations because you're worried it's gonna affect college because it won't. Um, but college is not under IDEA, it's under the ADA. And so your child, assuming that they are 18 when they start college, needs to go on their own to the Office of Disability Services and there will be an intake form and it's different at each university. It's gonna require documentation of their disability from a doctor and suggestions for accommodations. Um, but there'll be other paperwork too. And then the types of accommodations um, are different. So kind of like with a private school, they don't have to do huge changes. Um, but at college, you might get uh, preferential scheduling so that you can make sure that all your classes are on the first floor or elevator accessible buildings. You can get preferential um, signing up for dorms so that you can make sure you get a first floor dorm because there's nothing worse than being on the 12th floor and the elevator goes out and now you've got to walk all the 12 flights up and down at three in the morning when someone burns their popcorn. Um, use of a computer during class. Um, scribe, some of the similar academic things you get. I got transportation around campus provided by campus security. Um, and it, at one university for grad school, they even picked me up at my apartment and took me to my classes. Um, and I can talk, you more, talk to you more about that privately too, if you want. So you brought up an in interesting point about how when, when, if the student goes to college at the age of 18, they have to do it themselves. And so through this process, your kids are younger now, um, but how do you empower your kids through this process as they're getting older? You know, like you said, Julian doesn't want to say no to an adult. So in both of you have kids that are still young, but looking ahead, like how are you, you don't go from not empowering them to empowering them. So how do you slowly get into that? Um, my mom had me making all my own specialist appointments by 14 and you know, at 14, she would remind me, but I was the one who had to make the phone call and go through the process and get it on the calendar and handle all of that. Um, so for the past couple of years, I've had Julian um, tell me questions he wants answered ahead of time, and I wrote, write those down for him. I offer to leave the room so that he can have time to talk with his doctors by himself if he wants. Um, and I talk with him about the process that I go through with the school. So he's not attending his 504 meetings yet. He probably will in a few years. But I talk about what I'm preparing, the type of things that I'm asking for and why, and um, how those go. And so then when there was an issue with gym class last year, I was very transparent about how I handled it. I mean, I didn't go through the ins and outs of every single conversation I had, but um, explained why. And we have now role play what he can say to an adult and try to work with him on being more confident um, in having those conversations. That's great. Abby, do you have anything to add to that? Any experiences in your house? Um, I, would, I would say, um, like I said earlier, you know, this year with COVID, um, I did put 
I did put some of it on John, you know, to take his flyers. Um, and he did a great job. I think when you can really start to involve your children when they're a little bit younger and get them used to, you know, doing things for themselves and advocating for themselves, um, I think, you know, that just helps prepare them for as they get older. Um, and I, if this hadn't happened this year, I mean, I couldn't obviously have imagined like, you know, not to, I mean, cause he's only eight, um, not taking him and, you know, introducing him to everybody. Um, but, you know, he did a great job. He took it to his teacher. His teacher said, you know, she had, oh, she was expecting his paper. So she knew, you know, about John, but I think that really helped him to feel like he was a part of, um, you know, his, of his care and he was able to hand these out. So I think it is, I think it is important to start involving them when they're younger. And I don't know about at John's school, but at, at ours, Julian has been giving presentations every, every February for Marfan Awareness Month. And so he started in kindergarten, which then was mostly me coming in and, and we read Marfan A to Z to his class. Um, and then the next year, he it was like half and half. Um, so that last year in third grade, he created his own PowerPoint. I just helped him with the spelling and like adding in the pictures. Um, and I didn't go to school at all. And he gave the PowerPoint to his class. And he likes to say, my mom started giving presentations on Marfan when she was 14, but I started at five. Um, so I right. hope that he continues to, to want to share and talk about it um, as he gets older. Yeah, That's and, and I think they want, you know, they, they already have, I feel like so much taken away from them um, that it's really important you know, that they, that they feel, you know, that, that they fit in with these other kids. We do every year, um, you know, through Annabelle's challenge, they do Reds for Veds Day. And that's become a huge deal um, with John and his friends and even his brother and sister. They all wear their red shirts. They pass out, um, you know, Reds for Veds bracelets. I mean, it's, you know, to all of their friends, I, their friends all know about it. Um, and, you know, on the, especially on that day, John feels, you know, like he's really important. Like that's a really special day for him. So I think doing things like that, you know, I think that's great for them. Well, Mar well Maya mentioned that February is Marfan Awareness Month. Um, October is going to be the first Veds Action Month. So that gives opportunities. And June is Lois Dietz Awareness Month. So plenty of ways to get your kids involved and, um, embrace what they're dealing with and, and be proud of themselves. Um, so I want to ask each of you, I mean, you gave so much information about what parents, um, you know, should know about this whole process. And so Maya, what are three things that you, what are the three most important things you wish you knew when you, when you started this whole thing with, um, with Julian at school? I wish that I'd known that he would be affected differently than me. I remember blogging shortly after he was born and I was like, oh, we don't even have to worry about any of this Marfan stuff until he's like late elementary school, which was wrong. <laughs> like we had to deal with stuff early on. Um, so there, I still had a lot um, to learn. And um, I wish that, I don't want to sound cynical, but to know that I'm the only one who cares about my kid in the, in the way a parent can. Like our teachers are great, our school's great, but he's not their first priority because they have a school full of children. And so it's my job to make sure that um, stuff is happening. And then to figure out who, you know, my allies are at the school for lack of a better word, who are, who are his champions mm -hmm. and develop those relationships with them um, and we have some great champions in our school district that have been so helpful for Julian and for my other kids that receive um, special education services and it's great. Um, Abby, here's a question for you from a parent of a five month old with Lowy Seed Syndrome. Um, she's a, this person's a parent and a teacher. I'm interested in anything that came from the schools themselves besides the psych support that made life easier for you. Um, hmm. Maya, is there anything that you can think I, of? I can't think of anything at the moment. 
we had a, a couple of teachers over the years who were really thoughtful about um, ways they could help adapt things to make sure that Julian was included. And so just having teachers who were great about communicating with us and asking questions, like it's worth more than their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. I will, yeah, and, and now that you say that, Maya, I do, I do see that like with, you know, I would say the main one with John would be his PE teacher. And I think a lot of that was because of the limitations, um, you know, that John has, and he has, be, he has become very close with his PE teacher. Um, and I feel like he's really, you know, just taken John under his wing because he really, you know, I mean, he, I don't want to say he feels sorry for him, but he, he really wants John to be able to be um, to participate like the other kids. So he goes above and beyond. Um, you know, like I talked about earlier, um, if they're playing games, um, you know, with balls, that would be maybe too hard for John to catch or, um, you know, he has special balls that John can use and then he can participate. So, so yeah, I, if you, you, the teachers that are really, on your side, I mean, you will, you will know though, pretty, I mean, pretty quick when they start school. We have one parent um, participating tonight who was a three-year-old starting school in September. This was a lot of information. They want to know where do they start? Meet with the teacher? Is it bring, you know, collect documents? What do you bring? So starting at ground zero, what's first? Okay. So if you're in the U.S., um, if you think you're going to potentially go the IEP route, you want to reach out to the school psychologist, and that's who you want to ask to start the evaluation process. Um, and if you're looking for just the health plan or a 504, then most schools, if not all of them, it's through the guidance counselor, and that's who you want to email. And then while you're waiting for those meetings, ask for a letter from your doctor um, documenting the diagnosis, and then any suggestions for um, modifications or accommodations that your doctor has. And I would have the conversation with them first so that you know what it is that they're going to say before they send that letter to you so you can make sure that it encompasses what you want um, and then go from there. There's not a ton of documentation that they need, but they definitely will want proof of diagnosis. And I would say um, separate from like the, the 504 and the IEP, um, would be to really meet with the with your child's teacher and really explain to them what you know this condition that your child has really create um, that relationship with them um, i've always found over the years that that people want to help they just don't know how so you really need to put it out there for them and ex you know explain what it is um, and what they can do to help your child and the teacher packet on the foundation's website is a good resource, but if I'm being honest, I don't print out the packet and give it to the teachers because it is way too long. Um, I have cut and paste pieces that are relevant to Julian and I make a one page mm -hmm. document. And then the PE teacher gets the PDF from the physical activity guidelines. But your kid's teacher has 20, maybe even 30 kids and a good chunk of them are going to be receiving some kind of special education services. So you don't want to overwhelm them with information, but you want to make sure that they get the most important parts. And the links to both of those documents are in the chat box here. So um, we have a few final things that we want to do here um, before we close this session. Um, if your questions weren't answered tonight, um, Maya and Abby have both said that, that you can direct message them through the app and they will be glad to help. Um, you can also submit questions to our help center. That's martin.org slash e3ask. Uh, just be patient with in waiting for your response because as you can imagine, it's quite a high volume right now. Um, there is a session survey in the app um, right next to the Q&A box. It says rate this session or rate with some stars. So give us a lot of stars. Um, we'll rate the session. Um, we also hope that you'll visit the exhibitors in our virtual exhibit hall. They've been so generous to help support this program so we can bring it to you all over the world. And if you haven't already, um, get active in the community groups that are in the app. It's incredible what's going on. People are 
connecting and meeting people from all over the world, uh, you know, parents, um, you know, all different interest groups. So that's really a great um, benefit to the summit and this app. And if you would like to share what you've learned on social media or say something nice about this session or just about your experience, we'd love to see that on social media. And you can use our hashtag E3 Summit 20 and then we will be able to see that and we would love to love to uh, see that out there and let everybody know what a great experience you're having. And so before we say good night, I just wanna ask our speakers if they have any other last words. Um, Abby, any final thoughts? Um, I will. I would say um, the best the best help I have gotten is within the VEDS community. So don't be afraid to reach out, um, you know, and really connect with other parents. Um, you will you will get tons of input, tons of support that way. Um, so don't hesitate, you know, to reach out. I know through the VEDS movement, um, there's a connections program. Um, I also do a monthly parent support group through the VEDS movement. Um, we do the fourth Tuesday, I believe it's the fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, it's on the webpage, so please join if you haven't um, done that, and we'd love to support you. Maya, any final thoughts? Um, the foundation has a mentorship program, so that's a great way to connect with other parents, and we have some great groups over social media for connecting. And also, um, if you're working on your child's 504 IEP and you'd like another set of eyes, or some more in-depth help setting up the process, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help um, walk you through steps or brainstorm potential modifications or accommodations for your child and kind of go over um, the document with you. So you can just message me through the app or on Facebook. Great, well, thank you so much, both Abby and Maya. And so nice that you're able to take this hour away from your families and share all this information with our attendees. So thank you, everybody, and have a great night. We hope that to see you at other sessions through the summit. Thank you. Thanks.